A tool for extending certain of the powers of man's mind. This tool is the electronic computer. Looking back 60 years, this was cutting edge. The high-speed digital computer is a multi-purpose instrument. Soon, time and technology passed it by, but today those machines have new life at Living Computers Museum and Labs. So we have computers from the 1950s to today, and we really want people to come in and experience them firsthand operating and running, um, and not just behind glass. We are probably the only place in the world that has the largest collection of computers that are operational. And everything works. That explains the living part of the museum's name. Let's take a look around. So over here we have the Traffa Data Computer. This was the first product that was ever made by Paul Allen and Bill Gates. And what they were producing was this small computer that would take the data from those rubber strips that go across roads and read it into a computer system and digitize it. So here we have an Apple One computer. This is Apple's first product. This is the only Apple One that's regularly used in the entire world. And not only that, every visitor to the museum can sit down and use this computer. So here we have our cold room. This is where the mainframes and supercomputers are. So what we have here is a Xerox Sigma 9 mainframe computer system. It's a large scale computer system introduced in 1971. And what's interesting is we have a letter here from 1975 from the president of Xerox saying that they don't think computers will ever be profitable and they're getting out of the business. So what we have here is an IBM 360 Model 91 panel. So unfortunately here, this is all that's left of what would have been a room-sized computer system, um, an IBM 360 system similar to what was used at NASA. One of the uh, characteristics of human beings is uh, uh, that among other things that they do is that they solve problems. A big problem for Microsoft co-founder Paul Allen, a lot of old computers were being tossed. That's when he stepped in. I mean, about 15 years ago, he had the insight that these old computers were just being thrown away, uh, especially the mainframes. They're big, clunky things, and people were just scrapping them, basically. And he realized, well, maybe somebody should save some of those. And so he started buying a few, and then he would bring in some engineers, get it running. Hi, I'm Keith Perez senior systems engineer with the Living Computer Museum. First thing we had to do was an evaluation of the physical machine and the components inside. The machine generates a lot of heat, uh, about 7,000 watts. For our experience with previous machines we've restored showed that the most likely scenario, the, if we actually tried to operate the machine with those components in there, it would keep, uh, burst into flames. So obviously you don't want to do that. <laughs> This led to a painstaking process of manufacturing new parts using a 3D printer. Once we've restored the machine, uh, it will be the only one in the world operating. Keith Perez has spent three years working to revive this ailing machine. He's getting close. This is how you power on a, a Bendix G15. So we want to get an idea of scale. This is a module from the Bendix. So this is four transistors. This is four billion transistors in a typical smartphone. And while restoring vintage computers remains a core mission, the museum recently took a dramatic leap forward, broadening its appeal. So we doubled the size of the museum just a year ago, um, opening a whole new floor, and really the, the interest there was how do we take it more up to the modern day? Everything from autonomous vehicles and drones to digital artwork and robotics and you know, across the whole spectrum of technology. From virtual to vintage, this museum satisfies many tastes. But there's also an educational component which adds an extra dimension. We do a lot of field trips for that elementary school age. And then I tell them, oh yeah, we do preschool too. And they're like, what? This, this is incredible. I really like programming even though I have trouble getting my ideas out on paper or on the screen. A lot of what I do is actually to help the community figure out how do you even deal with this field of computer science. So what we've tried to do here is actually give a lot of different types of workshop experiences so that they can try lots of different things and then eventually pick, oh, okay, this might be something I want to go do. The educational process also plays out daily as visitors share their feelings about technology. This mother and son love robotics, but they differ when it comes to old computers. 
but I think especially for the kids, I like showing them my old computer. The keyboard is, everything's in a weird place. Uh, we had a computer in 1987, 86, an Apple. Nothing I'm used to, screen is dim, there's no real backspace. They can actually see what I was talking about. Ridiculously evolved, but I guess that's what they had. The sense of awe and mystery that we may experience when we see a computer in operation is really awe at the accumulated months and years of thinking by human problem solvers. It's difficult to escape technology's grasp. A visit here provides a powerful reminder of the magnitude of its reach and impact. At the Living Computers Museum and Labs, they simply call it the look. And the look is when somebody comes to the museum, they walk around, they're kind of interested, they see things, and then they just kind of go, and they run to a particular machine because it was, for them, a lot of times it was their first computer or the computer they wrote their dissertation on. I try to walk through the museum multiple times a day just to catch those little moments because they're so gratifying to see. The major task is to extend and augment human judgment by means of high-speed electronic digital computers. Watch City Stream Thursday nights at 7 on the Seattle Channel. Or get video on demand and podcasts anytime at seattlechannel.org.